CHCO Television is pleased to present provincial election coverage. This is Meet Your Candidates, and now your host, Vicki Hogar. Hello, I'm Vicki Hogar. As part of CHCO's coverage of the provincial election in New Brunswick Southwest, we invited all candidates from the two ridings to give us some insight on who they are and what they represent to help you, the voter, on Election Day. Over the next hour, you will meet three of the five candidates from the Fundy and the Isle St. John West riding who accepted our invitation for television broadcast time on CHCO TV. We hope you find the conversations informative. First up, in alphabetical order, is progressive conservative candidate Andrea Anderson. Andrea, where did you grow up and how did you get involved in politics? I am a Charlotte County girl. So I was raised north of St. Stephen. So if you're leaving St. Stephen, you're heading north towards McAdam. Mm -hmm. You get out to the woods, you go about 20 minutes further and you're gonna find a place called Andersonville. Mm -hmm. And I am Andrea Anderson from Andersonville. <laughs> I am the youngest in my family. And interestingly enough, I am the last of my siblings to be here in the province of New Brunswick. And that has some of the reason mm -hmm. to do with why I'm in politics or heading for politics today. You're a lawyer. I am. So tell me a little bit about that. What drew you into that profession before becoming a politician? Uh, okay, so let's go back to when I was nine. <laughs> when I was nine, I fell in love with government. I met Greg Thompson, and I was immediately fascinated by Mr. Thompson and what he was doing. And that was really unique because my family never engaged in politics. In fact, we were the family that nobody discussed how you voted. But I just loved politics and I loved government. Now, as a student, I was very strong academically. And my big act of rebellion when I graduated was to take an arts degree. I had a couple of teachers sit me down and tell me how ridiculous it was. I was strong in math and science and I should head into the engineering world. But I wanted to do an arts degree. And I did a double honors in political science and history because I loved government. And I don't know, do you have an arts degree? Mm -hmm. Masters of Arts, too. <laughs> what do we do with arts degrees? <laughs> okay. This, I guess. Or you become a lawyer. Right? So that was, you know, it seemed like a, a natural path to go down. Mm -hmm. I became a lawyer, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing today. And you're a litigator. I am so a what litigator. What does that mean? So I say I'm a litigator, but I'm also a barrister. So mm -hmm. I, when I started practicing law, I started in the city. I was in St. John, and I was there for six years, and I was more attracted to the litigation end, which is the courtroom work. I am now a sole practitioner in St. George, and because it's a small town, you end up doing a little bit of everything. So I do some property work and some estate planning. I get to deal with everybody on a variety of issues. But where I feel like I'm really at my game is in the courtroom. It is where I am the most comfortable. I love being able to meet with clients who are in very difficult situations, empathize with them, understand their problems, and then be able to vocalize that message in the courtroom. And how, when and why did that transfer into a political career? Well, I think it's, it's just, it's very similar, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I want to do for Fund of the Isle St. John West. I always say nobody comes into a lawyer's office with happy things in their life, okay? You never see <laughs> happy people in your office. People have problems, and they're across the board. So I have done litigation matters uh, with medical malpractice to property disputes to family matters. And I love that because I get to jump into what the problem is. I get to learn about things that really I've never had to learn about before, especially when I think about like the medical malpractice stuff that I've been involved in, and understand it, relate to the individuals, and vocalize it, fight for them. And I think that that's the same thing in government and politics. Like I am not representing to people when I'm heading door to door that I understand where everybody's at mm -hmm. and what all the problems are. But what I am saying when I go door to door is that's what I want to do. I want to talk to people. I want to find out what the problems are. And I want to advocate for them. Why did you choose to align yourself with the Conservative Party? What was it about the Conservatives that made you feel that was where the avenue you wanted to go down? OK, so a couple of things. I guess I already revealed that I loved Greg Thompson when I was <laughs> nine, right? So I probably had a little bit of leaning that way. But I have to tell you that uh, when I was working in St. John, I worked for a law firm that was tended to be much more liberal. So I was associated with the federal liberal party for quite a few years. So when I decided that I needed to jump into this career change, 
first of all, it was my husband who he looked at me and he said, what's it going to be? Are we going to get out of this province or are you going to do something about it? Because we were traveling around Nova Scotia mm -hmm. looking for other places to live because we were so concerned about the direction the province of New Brunswick is going in. We hate the idea of leaving here because we love this place. But that's where we were at. So I said, okay, let's do this. We're going to do this as a family. And so I interviewed with a few different political parties. I knew that I wouldn't be heading towards the Liberals. Uh, I'd been engaged with them before, and a lot of our concern is where we see the federal and the provincial Liberals taking us right now. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and bash the other party. Um, really, I want to talk about our goals and our visions instead. Now, I did interview with the People's Alliance as well. Mm -hmm. and. I guess because I have some respect for some of the things that they are doing, that they're promoting. And when I talked to the Conservatives, I realized that they had similar positions. So for example, when I talked with the Conservatives, they were willing to discuss the difficult topics, like how we're dealing with language in our province. They were willing to talk about how MLAs are able to vote when they're in the legislature. So they're able, they're, we're kind of on a very similar path. Mm -hmm. We do have some differences, but I also realize that we need change in this province and we need people who are brave enough and bold enough to stand up and face the issues. And I, I feel like I'm that person. So what would you say are the key points of your platform? I know that's a hard thing to, yeah. to really summarizing a few key points. But. Well, and it relates very much to that other question that you just asked yeah. me about what attracted me to the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the media paints us, in my opinion, a certain way. And a friend of mine, um, he said to me a while ago, I was almost a little embarrassed to tell him mm -hmm. that I was signing up for the Conservatives because mm -hmm. I had made certain judgments about him. And when I told him I was going to run for the Conservatives, he said, Andrea, I'm a Conservative too. And I was like, what? Anyway, um, and he said, listen, just because the media paints us as being against the environment, um, being socially out there, you know, the party of 40 years ago, mm -hmm. don't buy that. Conservatives still appreciate and want to respect our environment. Conservatives are still positive about social programs. I mean, we're Canadian. That is part of our fundamental core, is taking care of one another. The difference with a conservative is we are fiscally responsible. So just like in my house, I have to balance my budget at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Conservatives are the same way. We are very focused on not wasting money, but being responsible to the taxpayers who are giving us this money. This isn't just our money to spend. This is your money mm -hmm. that you have given us and you expect for us to spend it wisely. Or at least I expect people to spend my money wisely. That's the difference. Yeah. So to put that in maybe more concrete form, what would be f a few things you would do if you, if you win on the 24th that you would do right away if you were in office? Or put into effect, they don't have to necessarily right. be done. Really, the number one thing for me is to be that very vocal voice. Our riding has changed boundaries somewhat over the years. So now it's Fundy the Isle, St. John West. It goes all the way from St. George up to St. John West. Uh, so Route 3, and we head all the way up to almost the Sobeys in Grand Bay. It's a big riding, and the boundaries have changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the core of this particular riding has been liberal for nearly 40 years. And we have had some great representation over the years. However, because we have always had the same political color in this riding, I feel that people in Fundy the Isle St. John West are underrepresented or underappreciated and overlooked. We're taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So my number one thing for this riding would be not taken for granted anymore. We are, I'm a bit biased, we are the best area in the province. Like if you ever grab a tourist information booklet, the pictures that you see, mm -hmm. they're from right here. Mm -hmm. Like we are a hidden gem and we need to be proud of that and we need to make people proud of it again. What would you say qualifies you to be a politician? A lot of people will say that people they vote into office aren't might have a lot of things on paper that they'd like to get done, but when it comes to implementing them, are 
and capable? How do you qualify yourself as someone who can stand right. for things and then make them happen? Okay, so here's what I'm hearing at the door. When I go door to door, I am amazed at how discouraged people are. And sometimes it's hard to go door to door mm -hmm. because see, people are very frustrated with the direction that our province is going in and a lot of people do make the statement, you're never going to be able to change things. Like we are in such a bad place right now, you're never going to make a difference. Do you know how many times I have heard that as a lawyer? I remember one of my favorite um, litigation matters that I did. It was for an, a family in Grand Manan. And I won't get into the details of mm -hmm. what it was, but I went into the courtroom and there was a, a lawyer here from Charlotte County who was just ahead of me. He had a short matter and then I was going next and we were going into a five day trial. And uh, I'll even tell you, no, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> he, he looked at me and he said, what are you doing here today, Andrea? And I said, mm, this is what I'm here for. And I told him the story of the people I was representing and he looked at me and he laughed and he said, you're gonna lose. And I said, mm, okay. And because I don't take on arguments that I don't intend to be successful with. And I do my research. And you know what, we went to trial for five days and we were successful. I love it when people look at me and challenge me and say, you can't do this. I say, watch me, right? We're gonna do this. And I am still optimistic that we can turn things around in this province. It's not gonna be quick. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to try and we're going to we're going to make changes. I believe it can happen. So, do you have any final remarks for the voters before they go to the polls? Am I getting to the end of my time already? You are. Oh, geez, I didn't even talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> do I have any final remarks? Okay. You know what I find very interesting as I mm -hmm. go door to door is there is such a difference from one end of the riding to the other. So locally, people do want to talk to me about where I'm from and, and personal matters about mm -hmm. what I'm like and get to know me. And there's certainly an importance to that. They want to know that I'm nice or that I'm open to talk to people and I think I'm all of those things. Um, they want to, they just want to find out about my character mm -hmm. and that's good. And I think a lot of people will make decisions based on my character in this end of the riding. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the riding, closer to the city, mm -hmm. people never ask me about my character or who I am or where I'm from or how many children I have. Instead, I'm walking up to the door and they're looking at me and they're saying, you're Andrea. And I say, yes, I am. And then we talk about our leader. We talk about the platform. It's, it's just very different. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily even want to get to know me. But to me, when you're heading to the polls, you've got to take those two things and put them mm -hmm. together, right? Because both of those issues are important. It is important to not only consider the characteristics of the candidate that you're voting for, but also the platform that they're advocating for. Mm -hmm. You also have to consider their leader, the direction the party is going in, and it's a combination of those two. So don't get pushed too far this way or too far that way. Bring all of that together and make your decision that way. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And best of luck on the 24th. This was fun. I hope yeah. we get to do it again sometime. I hope so too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's very easy to vote. You should have received a voter card in the mail. If not, your ID and a piece of mail or even a friend who can vouch for you will suffice. Up next, running for the People's Alliance Party in the Fundy and the Isles St. John West riding is Doug Ellis. So Doug, I guess to start off, I would love to know about where you grew up and what got you interested in being in politics in Charlotte County in particular. Okay, sure. So uh, I was born in St. John in 1959. Uh, in, I grew up in, I, I'd have to say southern New Brunswick because we moved a lot between the St. John and Moncton area a lot until I was about about 10 years old uh, at which point the family settled in the outskirts of St. John and I've lived in the outskirts of St. John ever since. Uh, I uh, married a wonderful woman when I, was turn, when I turned 25 and we lived in the outskirts of St. John and we finally settled in on the Kingston Peninsula, and we've lived there ever since. We love it there. Uh, we've raised two wonderful boys, and uh, they're they're both out on their own now, and and doing their own things. So, so that's kind of kind of uh, all that. What made you want to get into politics specifically in this area? So, uh, my parents were born in Charlotte County. Uh, my my father grew up in Lepreau. 
My mother grew up in Bethel, just, just this side of St. George. Uh, in, as a child, I spent most of my summers in the La Pro, Never Beach area. Uh, I've done a lot of hunting, fishing, camping in Charlotte County every, pretty much every year ever since. Uh, we have a family cottage on Diggity Wash Lake. There's time spent there with family. Uh, I really care. I really care about Charlotte County. It, it's a, it's a, a wonderful place. Was there sure. anything in particular um, that sort of incited your move into politics that you thought you could change here? So I've watched politics all my life, um, and I've seen many people become disenfranchised and disappointed in the system. Uh, I. A lot of us sit around the, the, the coffee table and complain about politics. I just got to a point in my life where I decided it's, it's time to be a little more involved, uh, become more active, and, and try, to, try to make a change uh, in the direction not that I feel things need to go. I chose here because I have strong ties to the area. I, I really love the area and I'd like, I'd like to see Things improve here around tourism. Uh, I'd like to see some some improvements made in the forestry sector. I'm now learning a lot about the fishery, and that looks really interesting to me. I've got a lot of questions in uh, in that area from people through Facebook and whatnot, and and I'm thinking about that a whole lot more than I have in the past, for sure. Can you walk us through the key points of your platform? So the key the the key things in our platform is. Uh, we want to we want to bring a change to politics in that uh, we don't agree with towing party lines. We want our MLAs to be able to vote the way their constituents want them to. So there'd be no kicking anyone out of of the uh, uh, caucus or anything because they represented their their constituents. Because that's what we're all about. That we want to bring democracy back. Uh, we, we see our debt as getting overwhelming. We're at $14.5 billion right now. Uh, the interest payments on that each year alone is uh, about three quarters of a billion dollars. And that money is doing absolutely nothing for us now other than allowing us to carry that debt. So that money could be used for better things for sure. We, we, there's shortages in all, uh, in all kinds of areas, be the in the healthcare or education, and and our roads are going downhill. We need, those things need to be addressed as well. Um, we we want to see some uh, changes in the the way natural resources are handled. Uh, there should be uh, royalties put on things to such a level that we're not losing money on it. Uh, the way it's been working over the last quite a few years is we get a certain amount of royalties, but the province ends up subsidizing the industry in the end because we're, we're having to pay uh, to keep those things going more than we have coming in. Uh, so we'd like, and we'd like to see uh, in the area of forestry, for example, uh, there's, there should, the stumpage fee should be higher. Uh, we, we would like to see the clear cuttings, clear cuts get smaller uh, because the large clear cuts are causing problems for our wildlife. The, the habitat is, is, is going away. Their feedlots are getting smaller. And uh, you see a lot of deer moving into, into the towns and cities because there's nothing out there, there's nothing out there for them to live on. Uh, we'd like to see the spraying of herbicides on, on crown land stop altogether, ban it, because uh, that's causing problems in the same way that clear cuts are. Uh, and, it, and it's causing our forest to not be diversified anymore. A diversified forest is, is very important uh, for our wildlife, as well as uh, if, we had a more, if we had a better forest system, like uh, more mature and whatnot, uh, it, we could have uh, responsible recreation take place and, mm -hmm. and that could be a tourism thing and it, it'd be more enjoyable for our citizens as well. Um, uh, let's see, so... Uh, um, what would be the... 
if you're elected, what would be the first few things that you would put into effect right away? So uh, something that would happen very quickly is uh, we would increase the budget for the Auditor General and uh, we would leverage that to help us figure out how, uh, where the system is working and where it's not. So we could cut dollars from the areas where it's not changed how that works. And uh, we, we use that for many different things. So that's a matter of getting in and looking at the books and figuring things out, right? So that, that would be key right early. Uh, another thing we would do very early on is we would eliminate the, the uh, small business tax because mm -hmm. we want to see uh, small business uh, prosper and grow. Uh, small business and medium-sized business uh, tends to create more jobs mm -hmm. than big corporations. Big corporations are all, are, well, they're all about the bottom line, but big corporations tend to uh, minimize jobs as much as possible. Uh, if, if our small and medium-sized businesses are, are, are flourishing, we can have more services closer to home. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd be less dependent on imports, and uh, it, would create, it would boost our economy locally. We'd be that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would uh, eliminate the, the uh, annual re-registering of vehicles every year. We would have a one-time registry for when it changes hands. So when you buy a car or a truck or whatever, mm -hmm. you would register it in your name. And you wouldn't have to do it every year at all. If you sell that, then whoever buys it would have to obviously re-register it in their name, so mm -hmm. it's not in your name anymore. Uh, we would eliminate the HST on private sale of vehicles. Uh, and we'd remove the front, uh, requirement for a front license plate. Uh, we would uh, be looking at eliminating all uh, any of the uh, corporate handouts mm -hmm. that that don't work. Like a lot of them don't work, uh, and it puts our small business at a disadvantage when you're propping up multi-billion-dollar companies, mm -hmm. right? So we we would be doing that very very quickly. Uh, another uh, around the official languages uh, act, we would be, uh, we, we're not against bilingualism. We, we just think the policies are, are done in such a way that, it, that it's not fair. Uh, uh, and it's actually creating problems. Uh, the official languages act has been used by people to get away with serious criminal charges like drunk driving. And that's not right, that's a public safety issue. Right now uh, we have uh, m uh, ambulances in our, in our province that are not on the road because they don't have enough bilingual staff to run them. There's a requirement right now to have one bilingual person in every ambulance. So when they, and they don't have enough bilingual people to do that, so they don't put the ambulance on the road. That's a public safety issue as well. When a citizen needs an ambulance, they need an ambulance. Uh, we, let me think, uh, we would, we are, want to look at our animal protection. We want to prop that up a little bit. Uh, we're still working out the details on that, but that's something that's in there. What would you say? A lot of people will say that politicians, their background can be from anywhere. What qualifies you to be a politician? Well, uh, I thought about that a lot. Uh, what qualifies me to be a politician is that I care and I want to see a difference. How do you know that you'll be effective? What, what is it about who you are and your background that you are sure that you are the one who can sort of? Well, I, I, I work at MBTEL. I started at MBTEL uh, in 81 working in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, I got transferred to the IT, IT department in 85. And I started off as a junior programmer there and I worked my way up through until I retired uh, as a senior systems analyst for the last few years. Uh, worked in team environments, uh, we, and as teams we tackled diff difficult issues and came up with uh, solutions that worked. So uh, I'm a digger. Mm -hmm. I, I teach myself a lot uh, of what I'm doing. Uh, 
and I'm willing to learn about the issues, dig into all the possible solutions, and it's all about uh, dialogue, civil dialogue and communication between people to come up with the right solutions. So that's the approach I've used all my life, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's needed. What is it about the People's Alliance that attracted you to the party? Uh, I, get, I guess it's the, bi the biggest thing is they want change. They want to bring democracy back, and that's something that's very important to me. Our democracy is slowly being eroded away, and, and our, our approach would be to bring that back. Uh, the debt level, th they want to tackle that, and I don't see anyone else doing that. If we get any deeper in the hole, debt-wise, I think we're going to sink. We're leaving a big bill for our kids and grandkids otherwise, and that's not fair. That our lifestyle should be propped up at the cost of theirs. So Doug, what are some of your final remarks that you'd like to tell voters before they go to the polls on the 24th? So, so uh, what I would like people to do is uh, to think about the issues, look at the parties and how they want to uh, deal with those issues, Come to your own opinion on uh, what the options are and get out and vote. Vote for what you th believe, the party you believe in closest and, and just get out and vote. Thank you so be, much. Be part of the change. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. If you have any questions or concerns on where or how to vote on September 24th, you can contact Elections MB at 1-888-858-VOTE or visit electionsnb.ca. Next, Romy Francis Huff is running for the Green Party in Funny in the Isle, St. John West riding. Romy, tell me about your background and what got you interested in politics in Charlotte County. Um, so my parents are Dutch immigrants. So um, I was born in Montreal. They started in Victoria and we, Montreal, then Newfoundland, and then New Brunswick, where my parents settled. My dad had his practice at the St. John General. Um, I guess my parents are political in a lot of respects, so they were always talking about what was right and what was wrong after living through Hitler's war and seeing all the atrocities that happened when people become elitist and think they're better than other people. So my parents always engaged us in proper you know, social interaction and being aware of what's going on and be independent and don't follow the crowd and think for yourself because they were doing their best, I think, as parents to prevent another set of atrocities based on people just blindly doing what they're told. So I've definitely been a bit of a rebel and independent thinker. Um, I have a chemistry degree from Mount Allison University and in 1984 at 22 years of age I took off on a motorcycle and headed west. <laughs> I went to, ended up in Victoria, British Columbia um, where I worked for a while as a chemist and then um, got into a motorcycle accident so I switched careers and got a degree in fashion merchandising and design and opened up a store in Fantan Alley as a fashion designer. This is <laughs> one of my pieces here. Um, and then I kind of didn't think I was doing good enough for my kids. At that point I had a couple of kids so I went back and got a, did a PhD at the University of Victoria in chemistry again, physical chemistry. and. Uh, I take that to the platform and to the table because my degree required analyzing a lot of very complicated data, mm -hmm. like extremely complicated. There was data from the 1960s that had been taken in Stockholm, Sweden that hadn't, no one had been able to crack the code. And so I spent seven years analyzing that data plus the data I developed on my own and plus data that we got from the University of New Brunswick. Actually, we actually were collaborating with the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton and had data. And so I put together a large amount of data, um, figured out a bunch of stuff. And when I presented it, I got an international award in Columbus, Ohio for my presentation and stuff. So, um, so I'm very good at figuring out what's going on. So I feel like that I bring that to the table because um, I feel like Nobody really understands what's, what's going on. Where's you know how much money does the government get from us, and where does that get spent, and you know how are they spending it? Sometimes we hear oh 23 million for a call center in Moncton, and you know millions here and millions there, mm -hmm. and you think, well, how much millions have they got to play with, and how come it's so hard for us to figure out our finances and our budget? And one Telegraph Journal ad will tell me that. Uh, Oh, the Liberals have balanced the budget just in time for the election, but then two days later there's another article in the Telegraph Journal saying that we're $13.9 billion in debt, or NB Power is, 
And then I think, okay, well, but they don't count, count that for some reason. And then, you know, a few days later, there's another article and someone's quoting that we're $16 billion in debt and we pay $700 million a year in um, uh, interest rates. And I think, who are we paying this interest rate to? Who did we borrow the money from? Why are they talking? Why did they just sign another $10 million deal to do 10 small nuclear reactors when we can't even afford it? Like, we're already in debt, and then I heard and read, I can't remember where it was, that the Liberals have spent so much money, and they've promised so much money, that it doesn't matter what government gets in, the next four years, we're going to be in so much more debt. It's so, they've already co signed contracts and given all the money that we're going to have from taxes away again, so any government that comes in is going to be in a mess. And I just think this is ridiculous, right? They've been using the same economic oh, growth model for how many years and it's not helping and it's not working. And I took economics in university and it's not all that, you know, it's supposed to be pretty straightforward, supply and demand. But um, anyway, the Green Party, which is where I'm representing, uh, because I totally believe in making some pretty fundamental changes mm -hmm. to the way we run systems and the way we treat people. That's, you know, the biggest things. It's not just environmental. People go, oh, Green mm -hmm. Party, you're tree huggers. It's like, no, we're a bunch of highly educated people that think the politicians of the last many uh, decades, perhaps centuries, I know I'm only going to go back as many years as I've been alive, um, have been squandering our money foolishly, giving money preferentially to large corporations, and really ignoring the common person, just giving them enough to fight over, just enough to keep them distracted and busy. So I'm just one of those people that are stepping up to the plate now to become a Green Party candidate to go, we need smarter representation. We need people who understand the bigger picture a whole lot better. And I feel like I bring that to the table. And I've been working in Charlotte County for six years as a digital literacy instructor. And that's a great place to be because while you're teaching people how to use computers, you're getting them online and looking at news stories and looking at things and so everybody's getting informed of what's going on in the world and then you can okay let's talk about it so now let's talk about our communities and what we think about life and what we think about people getting sick and everybody's got cancer and, and then we talk about the gmo foods and the pollution and the chem spraying and the forest spraying and then we think is all this contributing to our sickness? And then we talk about the 12 hour work days that all these big companies are switching over to. So now everybody's tired and then you, you come home from a 12 hour shift and you're, you don't want to cook a homemade meal. So you're buying packaged food and that's full of salts and sugars and preservatives and, and stuff that's, you know, like chemicals that you shouldn't even be eating. And our toothpaste has fluoride we're not supposed to be ingesting. And then you think, who is in charge mm -hmm. of all this? And why is this even here? And why has our society gotten to this point? They've made the average person a worker or a client, or now the Tories go customer, you know, and what we should talk about New Brunswickers as customers. Like, no, how about New Brunswickers as citizens of this province? And how about New Brunswickers not only English and French and native and newcomer? We're the people who are living here, and why aren't we running the province? Why is it being run by large corporations? Why is our money being squandered? Why are we all so poor? Why is a third in New Brunswick on social assistance? You know, like, I can't believe, I can't even believe those stats. I think, really? But then you go to some places and you realize oh yeah seasonal work and minimum wage and nobody can make a living and mm -hmm. I've got four kids in their 20s and I watch them struggle and I think oh my god my kids are they're never gonna be like secure I'm not secure I don't have a pension coming in I'm working for a not-for-profit you know I'm not getting paid that much there's no benefits I choose to do it because I believe in not-for-profit I could have gone and worked for a pharmaceutical company and made big bucks but that wasn't me I was not into running and chasing money I wanted to do something that I felt like I was going to be contributing to society somehow I got all these smarts and this energy put it back in and do something with it. And I've mm -hmm. always been trying to figure out what's the best way. I've played with chemistry, I've played with fashion designing, I've played with teaching, and politics feels like the right place for me to be. There's obviously a lot you care about and a lot you need, think New Brunswick needs to, to put yeah. into action. If you could take three points of your platform and really cement them in voters' heads, what would they be? Things um, that you care about. So I guess we would say, uh, environment 
obviously a green environment so that means we're not going to be healthy if our environment's not healthy so our atmosphere our food our trees our plants our birds we need biodiversity that's a well-known fact any scientist will tell you that the healthiest environment is one where you have great biodiversity because then you've got variability you've got resilience we're killing biodiversity in our big farming our big agriculture so the green platform really is stressing small communities small community involvement so get together locally not these big centralized large areas that the current two governments keep going oh it's more economically efficient to manage uh, larger areas with a central thing well you know what you're not managing anything efficiently because each community should be in charge and understand their assets what's good what they can appreciate about themselves what maybe what they need so their deficits and let them each community decide for themselves what's their the direction that they want to grow in the direction they want to go and not have Fredericton tell people what to do or to all this top-down stuff I'm, we're totally not into top-down we think it should be bottom-up and that's a proven fact around all kinds of places in the world where they go into these third world countries and you can't tell a third world country how to run itself you always have to go to the people and you don't go oh you have a problem let's fix your problem no you go hey you guys are awesome you have all these strengths let's build on it and that's the appreciation model of community development and the green party totally stands for that the other thing that we want to make sure that we bring out to the people is that really people should be becoming more self-reliant mm -hmm. right because if you listen to the economic news which I am very interested in I follow economics um, they're talking about a global currency reset right now as we speak right so there's a gl global currency reset in the process right now that will probably be announced in the next month or two and what that's doing is taking the US dollar right out of the picture the petrodollar is already dead the US will not be the trade currency they're going to create a new global currency that means double digit inflation is on its way very soon and they don't want to talk about that no one wants to talk about that they just all like to pretend it's not going to happen let's just go on with our day and we're not going to worry about double digit inflation like it was in 1984 when i graduated from mount a my student loan was 13 and a quarter percent interest rate that's what i had to pay on my student loan when i got out of university and we're looking at that kind of inflation and worse coming again so if you've got that kind of inflation yet you're still expected to go to your job but the price of gas becomes higher and higher and higher and the price of food becomes higher and higher even if they the liberals say they're gonna try to freeze or they're gonna think about freezing power costs well it doesn't matter because everything is gonna go up who can afford to work who can afford not to work you know everybody's caught in that weird situation so we're sort of saying you know what you should have some chickens and learn a little bit about gardening and you should know your neighbor and your strengths and each small community again find out what you got that you've got together what you might need in case there's road closures because the roads are no good and you can't get out or there's flooding again now and you're trapped or whatever because um, environmental issues we know are on the increase right now today as we speak it's what the 14th of September in the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean there are the most hurricanes ever recorded in history the largest hurricanes ever recorded in history wreaking devastation on the Atlantic coast in the Philippines and Japan and hurricane season just started <laughs> right so people really have to think about how to take care of themselves and stop thinking that the government's going to take care of you because the government's not going to be able to take care of you when there's widespread natural disasters economic <coughs> inflation and collapse take care of yourself and take care of each other right take care of the least among you I always have this saying Jesus would vote green mm -hmm. you know it <laughs> right because he was saying take care of the least among you you know be take care be self-sufficient teach a man how to fish don't keep feeding him fish teach him how to fish so the social services we would be trying to get everybody who's on social development take away all the penalties for being industrious and and uh, entrepreneurial and say no go for it you're not going to lose any of your security that you have but if you've got a skill that you can share and you've got interests that you'd like to do if you've got something you'd like to do then we're going to encourage you to do that and start contributing to society because the least 
person has something to contribute and that's where dignity comes from and that's the structural change I think we need to make and the Green Party is willing to talk about it and make that structural change and encourage it whereas the other parties they don't want to they talk about other things but they don't want to talk about you no know, society itself we need to change our attitude we need to really think about each one of us has something to contribute we not all can't be bankers and lawyers and investment brokers you know so appreciate your farmer appreciate your shoemaker you know appreciate the guy who cleans and sweeps the hallway why not all those jobs need to be done so let's appreciate everybody and get everybody contributing and stop the whole welfare system right? anyway so I hope that's okay that's great okay. <laughs> I can't believe this when we put our time is up do you have 10 seconds any final words uh, to voters um thank you and thanks for listening I don't want to come across as being preachy and stuff I just know that I've got lots of skills and I really want to help bring things around and help people feel proud of New Brunswick. And I got lots of great ideas I can't wait to share and I can't wait to hear people's. Even if I'm not elected, I want people still to contact me and let's make committees and let's do it anyway. I don't need to be elected for that. That's something we can do on our own. <laughs> so <All right>. thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> thank you. We hope these interviews help you make better and more informed votes. I'm Vicki Hogarth. From all of us at CHCO, we hope you will make an important contribution to our community and vote on Election Day, September 24th. The news and public affairs production of CHCO-TV, New Brunswick's only source for independent community television.